Does Vatican II contain error? Are there problems in Vatican II? The documents, the procedures, etc. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about recommended books on Vatican II. We're going to talk about the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. And I'm going to hone in today on the five documents that are disputed. So when you hear people talking and debating about Vatican II, most people are just using the word Vatican II. Today, we're going to look at those five disputed documents and why people have a problem with them. This happened, this council happened in 1962 and it went to 1965. And here we are in 2020. There's a big controversy right now this week with Archbishop Vigano, who's saying, let's forget the council. Maybe we should just get rid of it altogether. We've got another viewpoint represented by Bishop Schneider. He says, well, maybe we can remove some documents. And there's a precedent for this in the Council of Constance, which is an ecumenical council. Bishop Schneider has, I think, a very good argument here. And then there's others who say, let's just do hermeneutic of continuity. This would be like Brand Mueller. This debate has broken open this week. Uh, a letter came out yesterday, signed originally by 50 uh, leaders, priests, scholars. I was one of them thanking Vigano and Schneider for opening up this dialogue. You know, the spirit of Vatican II, it's all about dialogue, people. So we should be able to dialogue about this. Unfortunately, in the spirit of Vatican II, you can dialogue Catholics, popes, bishops, cardinals. They can dialogue with Hindus. They can dialogue with Mohammedans, Hindus, Buddhists. But you can't dialogue with the traditional Catholic. They have to be pushed down. They have to be called extremists, conspiracy theorists, pseudo experts, Lefebvreites, schismatics, etc., etc., etc. What Vigano calls making your enemy ontological inferior. And here we are in 2020, we're still debating and talking about this. This council ended in 1965. Just to give you before we pray, just to give you some perspective and time, 1965 is, in America, presidency of LG, uh, LBJ, Lyndon Bain Johnson. That year, 1965, the number one hit was A Hard Day's Night by the Beatles. That's how long ago we're talking about. The film that won the Academy Award in 1965, when the Second Vatican Council ended, was Sound of Music. Sound of Music. And here we Catholics are still debating Vatican II and its legacy. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So today we're going to go over books you should read, the actual debate, the actual text, and then I'm going to summarize three views on what to do with the question of Vatican II, represented by Cardinal Brandmuller, Bishop Schneider, and Archbishop Vigano. So let's pray. we got to pray. We have to ask God to help us. We need help. We need help. And today's the feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I'm going to talk a little bit about scapular and Carmel at the end. I'm going to talk about rosary. But we need to pray and we need to ask God to protect us, to bless us, and to keep us from getting bitter. We have to be joyful. Oremos. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panam nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, se libra nos a malo. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Almighty God, bless us, protect us, help us to be faithful disciples of your Son, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, pray for us. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. All right, everybody, welcome. We are live right now. And before we begin, please just take a moment, if you like what we talked about already, and hit the thumbs up. Give this video a like. I really appreciate that. 
If you're new, please subscribe and hit the bell. You'll be notified. I am running this live right now. So if you want to be part of the live chat in the live feed of these videos, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of when we go live. And then the most important thing, I say it every time because it's so important, please share this video. Hit the share arrow right next to the thumbs up and share this video on YouTube. That's how this channel has been growing like crazy. I think 50,000 new subscribers last month. It's because y'all share the video. So thank you for sharing it. That's what gets it out more than anything is you, the people watching, sharing the video on Facebook, a whole new audience, tons of Protestants. I've heard from so many non-Catholics saying, I'm praying the rosary now. I'm coming back to Catholicism. I left. I'm now interested. This is, I'm excited. I'm seeing a new face of Catholicism that I hadn't heard in many years or I never did see. And so now they're interested. So thanks for sharing. You're bringing those people in and I appreciate it. It's great. It's great. Okay. This council ended in 1965. You know, the night, early 1960s, not the late 60s, but the early 60s were all about optimism. This was JFK time. This was, hey, you know what? It's the age of Aquarius is coming in. Uh, everything is good. We're going to get world peace. Uh, Everything is going to get figured out. It was a time, probably peak optimism in the history of humanity. And of course, all that came crashing down in the late 60s and into the 70s. Uh, we realized that original sin is for real. It's for real. But when you read the documents, the 16 documents of Vatican II, you, you kind of get that age of Aquarius groovy vibe, this positive, optimistic understanding of the world. And now suddenly humans are different. Humans are enlightened. And if we can just give peace a chance, everything is going to work out. And of course, that's not the case. That was an illusion in the early 60s. And unfortunately, when they opened the windows of the church, that cheesy, groovy optimism came in through the window. So that by the 1970s, you hear Paul VI say, the smoke of Satan has entered the church. Now, before I get in to the details and the documents of the Second Vatican Council and proposed solutions to dealing with the Second Vatican Council, I want to recommend four books. These are books that I have found extremely helpful. Yes, I've read them. They're awesome and they're fantastic. The first one is by one of the signers of the letter yesterday, Roberto De Matei. It's just called The Second Vatican Council. Roberto De Matei. This is the best history week by week, month by month, of the Second Vatican Council. It gives you the details, it gives you the names, it gets you, gives you who's on the floor, who's writing which document. It's very detailed, it's very scholarly and academic. If you really want to get down to the nitty gritty of what happened at the council, it's called the unwritten story. The behind the scenes of the council documented Roberto De Matei's book, Second Vatican Council. In fact, I don't even think, if someone wanted to debate me or get into an argument over Vatican II, I probably wouldn't even engage them until I said, have you at least read this book? Because this is what I would be drawing on, is this book right here, The Second Vatican Council. I footnote this book often and frequently. If you've read my book, Infiltration, I footnote and reference this book quite a bit. So you should go ahead and read it. The next book that I would recommend is... Christopher Ferrara and Thomas Wood's book, The Great Facade, also a mega book. Look how thick that is. This is, if you really want to get into it, Ferrara's book, The Great Facade. And he, Ferrara's been on my channel. You can search his name. A lot of good shows with Ferrara. We talk about what he covers in this church. It's called The Great Facade, The Regime of Novelty in the Catholic Church from Vatican II to the Francis Revolution. It's in its second edition. Okay, that's the second book I recommend. The next book I recommend is the book by Athanasius Schneider, Christus Vincit. This is not necessarily about Vatican II, but this is Bishop Schneider, who is a holy and pious bishop, very reserved, pastoral in a good way, academic, but he gives you the story from his own personal perspective. It's, an, it's autobiographical. And he also handles these questions of the Second Vatican Council 
in our time period right now, I think better than anyone else. So you need, and also this book will bring, this book has made me cry. The opening chapters of the faith of his mother and father under communist regimes and the way that they lived their Catholicism under persecution brought me to tears. So I love Bishop Athanasius Schneider. His book, Chris's Vincent, is definitely one you need to read, especially his section on the Second Vatican Council, which I will try my best to explain today towards the end of today's show. And then the fourth book you need to get is this one by myself, Infiltration. This is a history before the council. It explains how we got to Vatican II, and it explains Vatican II itself. And then it traces Vatican II all the way up into our present time. So this is going to give you the before, during, and after. This is, the infiltration is the meta narrative. Let's step back and let's look at it from a blimp, from a satellite, so that we can see what's going on. So this book documents a lot of everything that I've talked right here, but it gives you the big picture. That's why this book has been selling and doing so well is because people, they don't just want Vatican II. They want to understand why is this whole thing happening? Why do we have a Cardinal McCary? Why do we have ugly, banal liturgies? Why are youth leaving the church? Why are priests leaving? Why don't we have vocations? Why are there no more Catholic schools with nuns at them? Why, why do we have to be embarrassed about being a Catholic because of the sins and misdeeds of the hierarchy and a, a bad decisions being made in Rome. Why are these things happening? Well, infiltration was my attempt to understand for myself why this is happening. So I encourage you to read that. Those are the four books. Now, Vatican II is controversial because the Pope who closed it is Paul VI. When he closed it, he said something that's quite controversial. So it ended December 7th, 1965. This was the, the closing of the council. It's the first time that we ever saw that unusual uh, crucifix that John Paul II was so fond of carrying. Benedict, not so much. It's, I wish I had a picture ready, but I don't. Uh, it was debuted at this moment when the Pope said this. Paul VI said this at the closing of the Second Vatican Council, December 7th, 1965. He says, quote, The magisterium of the church did not wish to pronounce itself under the form of extraordinary dogmatic pronouncements, end quote. That's a big deal. I'm going to put on the screen. I want everybody to see this. Let's see if this will work. There we go. Perfect. There it is. Put it right, right up here on the top. The majesty of the church did not wish to pronounce itself under the form of extraordinary dogmatic pronouncements. In other words, it was not going to exercise extraordinary magisterium. People were perplexed by this. Wait, isn't that what ecumenical councils are supposed to do, Holy Father? So he clarified himself. And by the way, if you want these quotes, they're in my book, Infiltration, on page 143, both of them. I'm going to add it to this one here. So Paul VI then clarified a few months later, in January 1966. Let me see if I can make this better. Yeah, this is good here. In view of the pastoral nature of the council, it has avoided proclaiming in an extraordinary manner any dogma carrying the mark of infallibility. End quote. So here you have a pope, the one who saw the ending of Vatican II. He said the magisterium didn't want to pronounce under the form of extraordinary dogmatic pronouncements and then said, that it doesn't have any dogma carrying the mark of infallibility. So what does that mean for Vatican II? Vatican II is unique, my friends. Vatican II is a pastoral council. In fact, just this past week, Bishop Barron 
He's been doubling down. All these bishops got the memo, by the way. Stitka, Tobin, Baron. Hey, we got to double down on Vatican II. Vigano and others are starting to beat the drum. Let's all get out there and, and criminalize Vigano. And we got to talk about how awesome Vatican II and how good it's been for the church and how it's inspired faith and done all these great things. It's a pastoral council. And yet, the Pope who ended it in 65 and 66 said, hey, it's not under the extraordinary form, uh, no, not under the form of extraordinary dogmatic pronouncements and does not carry the mark of infallibility. So for people like myself, I think for Vigano, for Schneider, for many others, they say, okay, well, that means something's up for debate here in the Second Vatican Council. As I've said before, the Second Vatican Council was an ecumenical council with an asterisk next to it. It's unique in the history of the church. And the people who are all about Vatican II, they tell you this is a unique council. In fact, they talk about the Vatican II church, the conciliar church. They almost speak of it as a new church. Because something, something novel occurred in 1962 to 1965. Now, I mentioned earlier there was this document that just came out. This was reported at Catholic Family News and at LifeSite News. Uh, more than 50 priests, scholars, journalists, and other persons of promin uh, prominence published an open letter to Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano and Bishop Athanasius Schneider thanking these two prelates for their recent statements in which they discuss some problems of the Second Vatican Council's document documents that might need further evaluation and corrections. People who sign this are, for example, uh, Brian McCall, uh, who else is on? Henry Sire, author of Dictator Pope, Jose Antonio Ureta, great guy, met him in Rome, um, Father John Henwicky, Marco Tassati, uh, John Henry Weston, a lot of big names. And since that time, more people have signed the document. Uh, Christopher Ferrara, who I just mentioned, the author of The Great Facade here. Uh, Father Jay Finelli. Father Richard Heilman. Great Father Heilman. He's been on the show. Love Father Heilman. He signed it. Um, let's see. Who else here? More, more were added today, so it's hard to keep up. But good people, people that I respect, have signed this thank you note. This is a thank you note to Bishop Schneider and Archbishop Vigano. I'm going to go through some of the quotes uh, that are mentioned in that today. So if there is a dialogue, if there is a debate, if it's not infallible, it's, if it's not under the extraordinary dogmatic pronouncements of the church, then we should be able to go through the documents and say, this is ambiguous, this is problematic. And can we say this is erroneous? Is this an error that is in the church? There's a, a famous quote by Schilbex, a Dominican theologian, modernistic, who was at the council. And this is on page 144 of my book, Infiltration. He says, quote, We used ambiguous phrases during the council and we know how we will interpret them afterwards. This shows that landmines were placed in Vatican II. Liberal, heretical, modernist theologians said, on record, we used ambiguous phrases during the council and we would know how to interpret them afterwards. It's a coup. It's a coup. So now we have theologians Bishops, prominent laymen saying, okay, now is the time. Let's open up the discussions. So what you need to know are there are 16 documents in the Second Vatican Council. And the battleground, the debate that goes on are over five documents. These five documents are, get a pen and paper out. Here they are, Lumen Gentium. That's the Constitution on the Church. Sacrosanctum Concilium, that's the constitution on the liturgy, updating the liturgy. My least favorite 
to me, where the most problem is in Vatican II is Nostra Aetate. This is on non-Christian religions, and I'm going to read you some passages that are going to make you scratch your head. Another big one that's under tremendous debate, perhaps the most, Dignitatis Humanae. This is on religious liberty. Does a Hindu have a right from God to worship an idol? Does God give him that as a right that we should respect? Yes or no? What about a Satanist? Does he have a right to worship Satan? To have an idol to worship Satan? Does God give him that right? We're not talking about does God give him free will. Does he have a right, like we have a right to life? And then the fifth one is unitatis redingratio. This is on ecumenism. That word, ecumenism, ecumenism. I'm going to begin with Lumen Gentium. There are two passages that are problematic in Lumen Gentium. Now, by the way, before I get into these five documents, everyone agrees. I mean, whether you are Archbishop Vigano, you are Cardinal Brandmuller, you are Cardinal Burke, you are Archbishop Lefebvre, everyone agrees that there are true and good and pious things written in the pages of Vatican II. Not everything in it is absolutely incorrect and wrong. No one holds that. In fact, people, we all agree there are good things written in the Second Vatican Council. Let me give you an obvious example. In Lumen Gentium, which is the document I'm about to go over, in Lumen Gentium 62, it says, Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked by the Church under the titles of Advocate, Auxiliatrix, Adutrix, and Mediatrix. Great. We all love that. I love that. I say it's true. I am so glad Second Vatican Council said that. Uh, Bishop Schneider is all on board with that. Archbishop Vigano is two thumbs up on that. We all agree that in this case, the Second Vatican Council spoke piously and truthfully. So no one is saying we need to um, desecrate every sentence that's in the Second Vatican Council. So what we are doing now is mining the 16 documents and finding the problems that are debated. I just wanted to make that clear from the beginning, okay? There are some good things. But for an example, Martin Luther also said the Trinity is true, Jesus is the Son of God, and Mary is an ever-virgin. Martin Luther said all those things, and we say, good job, Martin Luther, you're right on those things, but you're also a heretic, right? So we can reject Luther as a heretic, even though he said some good things, right? So we have to be careful that we don't reject the good when we're trying to also understand what is wrong and what is incorrect. Okay, so back to Lumen Gentium. The biggest debate is on this term, subsists. All right, subsisted in. It says this in the council. The church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic church, which is governed by the successor of St. Peter and by the bishops in communion with him, etc. Now, the original draft of this document said that the church is the Catholic church. But it was changed in the last minute to say subsisted in. That the church subsists in the Catholic church. Now, here's what Bishop Schneider says is the problem with that. And I quote Bishop Schneider. It's the council's distinction between the church of Christ and the Catholic church, the problem of subsisted in, that gives the impression that two realities exist. The one side, the church of Christ. On the other, the Catholic church in its stance towards non-Christian religions in the contemporary world. All right, so let me break this down a little bit. You got two realities mentioned in Lumen Gentium, the Church of Christ and the Catholic Church. Traditional Catholic teaching would say those are one and the same reality. When you say the Church of Jesus Christ, there's only one church. And the Church of Jesus Christ is the Catholic Church. But what Vatican II in Lumen Gentium is saying is the Church of Christ, and it subsists in the Catholic Church. And Bishop Schneider is saying, well, this is presenting to us two things. 
two churches. It's almost like a platonic form of the church. And it subsists in the Catholic church. Do you see how that's a problem? Because perhaps the church could subsist in other places as well. Is it subsisting limited to the Catholic Church? Because now we have the Church of Jesus Christ as distinct from the Catholic Church. This is how you see in, in, in modern modernist Catholic discourse of the people of God. The people of God is everyone who is probably going to end up in heaven, whether they're baptized, whether they believe in Jesus. You know, this is, you know, you're in an ecumenical meeting and you're like, oh, you know, our Jewish friends, you know, they're all going to make it. And our Muslim friends, hey, they're monotheists, they're going to make it. Our Hindus, man, they really uh, revere the transcendent. They're going to make it. They're all part of the people of God. This is because you are breaking away Church of Christ from Catholic Church, so that there's the subsistent relationship. It's so, I mean, it's. It, I think probably it was maybe one of the original most controversial, and it's a little bit subtle. I mean, it relies on this obscure Latin phrase. Now, the other controversial element in Vatican II uh, regards Muslims. All right, so Lumen Gentium 16 says this. In the first place, among these are the Muslims who professing to hold the faith of Abraham along with us adore the one and merciful God who on the last day will judge mankind, end quote. Okay, so uh, if you remember the New St. Thomas Institute, I've talked about this and uh, I think I've modified my position over the years because what I said originally trying to do hermeneutic of continuity says, look, Lumen Gentium says, are the Muslims who professing to hold the faith of Abraham. Professing doesn't mean that you do. So this is kind of stretching the text. This is doing try, trying to do hermeneutic continuity. They profess to hold the faith of Abraham, but they don't, because Christ said that if you accepted Abraham, you would accept him as the son of God, period, John's gospel. So anyone, whether they're a Muslim or anyone who says, I don't accept Jesus as the Son of God, they don't have the faith of Abraham. They don't. And that's not me saying that. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord, saying that. Then it says, along with us, adore the one and merciful God. So what I've said in the past is, look, it's kind of like a bow and arrow. Catholics have the bow and arrow that's on point, Olympic style, and it can hit the bullseye with the right training. Muslims have like a stick with a string on it, like that your five-year-old would make in the backyard. And they can like pull it and they can, they can aim it at the target, but it never reaches the target. It never gets a bullseye. It never gets to, reaches its destination. So in a way, we're aiming at the same target, but the Catholic who has the sacraments and the truth can attain the bullseye. The Muslim with the, with the Mohammedan religion and the Quran can never attain the beatific vision of God. So in the past, that's kind of how I've done the hermeneutic of continuity and try to explain. But I mean, let's just ask ourselves, do Muslims with us adore the one true God? For example, at Mass, does Father offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass to Muhammad's God, to Allah? Does a Catholic priest offer Mass to the Allah of the Quran? I don't think so. <laughs> it might be. It's news to them. They are not offering the Holy Sac... The only true worship is through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me, says Jesus in John 14, 6. So you can't adore the Father unless you have the mediator who is Jesus Christ, because he's fully God and fully man. He's the perfect bridge. He's the perfect pontifex between God the Father and humanity. And not only is he um, ontologically in his hypostatic union, fully God and fully man, he's also the redeemer and the lamb of God who shed his blood for our sin. So he fixes the sin problem and he fixes the ontological chasm between God and man. 
Islam doesn't teach that. No. And then it says, who will judge mankind on the last day? Islam doesn't say that Jesus is, because we say Jesus will judge us because he's God. Islam doesn't believe Jesus is God. So that right there is also a factual problem right there in Lumen Gentium 16. I'd like to read the words of Bishop Schneider on this. Bishop Schneider says, quote, To state that Muslims adore together with us the one God, nobiscum deum adorant, as the Second Vatican Council did in Lumen Gentium number 16, is theologically a highly ambiguous affirmation. That we Catholics adore with the Muslims, the one God, is not true. We do not adore with them. In fact, in the fact of adoration, we always adore the Holy Trinity. We do not adore the one God, but rather the Holy Trinity. Consciously, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Islam rejects the Holy Trinity. When Muslims adore, they do not adore on the supernatural level of faith. Bishop Schneider goes on to say, quote, even our act of adoration is radically different. It is essentially different, precisely because we turn to God and adore him as children who are constituted within the ineffable dignity of divine filial adoption. And we do this with supernatural faith. However, the Muslims do not have supernatural faith, end quote. So this is, this is the problem. These are two problems in Lumen Gentium. A, that there's a church of Jesus Christ and there's a Catholic church that are two distinct realities and the church subsists in the Catholic church. That's a new idea of the church. And then the other is that Muslims adore with us the one true God. Think about this. You know the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople? It, it was a church. Then it became a museum, a mosque. Then it became a museum, and now it's going back to being a mosque. And everyone is upset. Christians are upset. Eastern Orthodox are upset. Catholics are upset. That was a church. It was stolen. It should be a church, not a mosque. Well, if you believe Lumen Gentium, about it, you should be happy. You should be, wait, Muslims were, adore God with us, and if it's going back to being a mosque, then it's going back to worshiping God Let's all praise the Muslims and say, good job, because now the church is being used in a good way. That's the consistency that Lumen Gentium would require of us. And yet in our gut, we know that that's not right. That should not be a mosque. That is not pleasing to Jesus Christ, that that building that was consecrated for the worship and for the miracle of transubstantiation in the divine liturgy that's what that building was made for. If for it to be a mosque is a betrayal. We know that. But if we follow the Lumen Gentium, we have to say, yay, standing ovation. Muslims are actually going to use it to adore with us the one true God. I'm not going in there and adoring Allah, and neither are you. Okay, the next document that I'm going to go over, we're going through the five documents that are problematic in Vatican II is Nostra Aetate. This is on non-Christian religions. Now, I found something so troubling it made me want to throw up, folks. When I was in, when I was doing research on infiltration, I discovered that the man who helped, who drafted this document, Nostra Aetate, was Father Gregory Baum. The document was overseen by Cardinal Bea. I don't trust him. I explain why in the book. But it was drafted by Father Gregory Baum, who would later leave the priesthood and marry a close female friend, Shirley Flynn. Despite his heterosexual marriage, he himself was openly homosexual. I'm reading on page 141. He himself was openly homosexual, admitting that he had loved another laicized priest in the 1980s. In his later years, he was an advocate for LGBT rights before dying in 2017. So the guy who drafted this document of Vatican II became a laicized priest, married a woman, 
and yet also had a hetero um, a homosexual relationship lasting into the 1980s. And in his final years, he was an LMNOP LGBT advocate. So the document that I'm about to discuss is drafted by this ex-father, Gregory Baum. Now, this document goes on to talk about non-Christian religions and how great they are and how there is truth in them and that by these nuggets of truth, these people who follow these non-Christian religions are in fact worshiping and engaging God. Even though John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Father Gregory Baum and Cardinal Bea drew up this document showing, oh no, that's not actually the case even though it's said in John 14, 6, there's other options. So let me read to you from Nostra Aetate. This part here is on Hinduism. Okay, here's what it says about Hinduism. This is in Vatican II. Thus, in Hinduism, men contemplate the divine mystery and express it through an exhaustible abundance of myths and through searching philosophical inquiry. They seek freedom from the anguish of our human condition, either through ascetical practices or profound meditation or a flight to God with love and trust, end quote. So let's back up here. According to Vatican II, Nostra Aetate, drafted by this ex-father Gregory Baum, Hindus contemplate the divine mystery. That's really amazing because... St. John of the Cross and St. Basil the Great and Gregory the Theologian, these great mystics, they were really struggling to contemplate God. It was taking daily mass, penances, confession, devotion to the Blessed Mother and the saints. Did I mention fasting? Sacraments, seven sacraments. And somehow Hindus who aren't baptized, who don't recognize Jesus Christ, they're contemplating the divine mysteries. Bummer, someone should have told St. Gregory Nazianzus. Someone should have told St. John of the Cross, hey, bro, try out Hinduism, it's working. And they express it, says Vatican II, through inexhaustible abundance of myths. Yeah, myths that are lies. You're talking about Shiva and Vishnu and all this stuff. Gods with many arms, gods with a elephant head, monkey gods. Really? They seek freedom from the anguish of our human condition. That's true. Either through ascetical practices or profound meditation or a flight to God with love and trust. So their meditation, which by the way, is on the mantra of the alm, right? They're trying to empty their soul. When we meditate as Christians, we think about Christ. We fill our heart and our mind with Christ. They're trying to empty themselves of everything. And their flight to God with love and trust. Hmm. Is that true about Hinduism? I'll leave it to you. Then Vatican II and Nostra Aetate talks about Buddhism. This one really gets me. This one gets my goat. Quote, Again, Buddhism, in its various forms, realizes the radical ins insufficiency of this changeable world. It teaches a way by which men, in a devout and confident spirit, may be able either to acquire the state of perfect liberation or attain, by their own efforts or through higher help, supreme illumination, end quote. Whoa, Vatican II. That's quite the endorsement of Buddhism. What a commercial for Buddhism. It, according to Vatican II, Nostra Aetate, they can have a devout and confident spirit and may be able to acquire the state of perfect liberation. I mean, not even St. Paul, the apostle, could get that perfect, that state of perfect liberation. He says he, he continues to strive and run the race, lest he be disqualified. That's what he said in the New Testament. But Buddhists, according to Vatican II, they can acquire a state of perfect liberation? 
without baptism, without the Eucharist, without confession? Wow. Buddhism must be really special, Vatican II. And can attain, by their own efforts, supreme illumination? That's the heresy of Pelagianism. How can a Buddhist, by his own efforts, get supreme illumination, Vatican II? This is false. This is not true. This is not true. Nostra Aetate is not true. By their own efforts or through higher help, supreme illumination. So the Buddhist, either by his own Pelagian superpowers in his human nature, can get supreme, supreme illumination or through higher help. What higher help? Angels? Saints? This isn't true. This is not true. Then he goes on to talk about other religions. This is Vatican II. Quote, Likewise, other religions found everywhere try to counter the restlessness of the human heart, each in its own manner by proposing ways, compromising teachings, rules of life, and sacred rites. End quote. This is a little bit more ambiguous, but really, do we want to say that other religions, that their teachings, rule of life, and their rites are proposing a way of salvation, as soon as you accept Nostra Aetate, as soon as you accept that statement, you might as well put the Pachamamas on every idol of the, on every altar of the Catholic Church. This is why Pope Francis sees no problem with it, is because he believes Nostra Aetate. Nostra Aetate says that the sacred rites, the teachings, the rules of life, or even the myths in the case of Hinduism, are proposing ways to God. They work. They work just like baptism, just like the Eucharist. They are a means of grace in the lives of these people. So if we say, no, you can't have idols, you have to have the Eucharist. They say, no, 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 no. No straitate. says right there that their teachings, their rules of life, their myths, their sacred rites, their rituals are a means in a way to salvation. Would any Catholic ever say that? Would St. Francis Xavier say that? The great missionaries say, oh, your idol to Jupiter, your idol to Venus, that's just a love of fertility, and fertility is life, and it's pro-life, so it's good. Worship that idol of Venus. That, no, that's not Catholic. Just not Catholic. The next document is Dignitatis Humanae. This is on religious freedom. And it says no one should be forced to embrace the Catholic faith. Agreed. No, we should never put a gun to someone's head or a spear to their heart and say, become Catholic or die. Has this happened in the history of the Catholic Church? I think it probably has happened in a couple instances. That's bad. I don't agree with that. You have to believe in Jesus by your own will, by your own heart, your own faith. This is what we believe as Catholics. Have people abused this before? Yes, yes. Have priests abused children? Yes, that's not what the priesthood is. So we don't define Catholicism by the abuses. So if anyone has ever threatened death, conversion at the point of the sword, that's an abuse and we reject it. So in a sense, in this sense, Dignitatis Humanae is correct. However, in order to substantiate this, Dignitatis Humanae says that people have a right based on the dignity of human nature to worship in their own way. And this follows from Nostra Aetate. If their rites and their myths and their rituals are leading them to God, then that means God gives them the right to do that. Now listen to what Archbishop Vigano has to say about this. Quote, But if at the time it could be difficult to think that a religious liberty condemned by Pope Pius XI, he's talking about Mortalium Animos, could be affirmed by Dignitatis Humanae, or that the Roman pontiff could see his authority usurped by a phantom Episcopal college. Today we understand 
that what was cleverly concealed in Vatican II is today affirmed or at rotondo in papal documents precisely in the name of the coherent application of the council. So Archbishop Vigano is saying, look, Pius XI said that false religions don't have a right. We tolerate them. We're not going to go and kill them because they're not Catholic. We tolerate them in society, but we don't say Satanist. You have a right to be a Satanist, to worship Satan. God gave you a right to do that. No. Bishop Schneider says something similar, and he relates it to the Abu Dhabi Declaration. Bishop Schneider says, For anyone who is intellectually honest and is seeking to square the circle, it is clear that the assertion made by Dignitatis Humanae, according to which every man has the right based in his own nature and therefore positively willed by God to practice and spread a religion according to his own conscience, does not differ substantially from the statement in the Abu Dhabi Declaration, which says, the pluralism and diversity of religions, color, sex, race, and language are willed by God in his wisdom through which he created human beings. This divine wisdom is the source from which the right to freedom of belief and the freedom to be different derives, end quote. So Bishop Schneider says, look, yes, Pope Francis is saying that God wills the plurality and diversity of religions, and that's bad. God doesn't will that people worship Hindu idols. You can't say that, right? You can't say that God wills for Muslims to reject the Trinity and to reject the divinity of Jesus Christ. You can't say that. That's a problem. Everybody see how that's a problem? But he says, but it's based in a Vatican II document, Dignitatis Humanae. So the problem is not just with Francis. The problem is, is that Francis is, in fact, implementing a document of the Second Vatican Council, Dignitatis Humanae. All right. The next, um, I'm getting short on time here, so I'm going to kind of speed up so I can get to the solutions. The next one is the decree on ecumenism with Christian religions. This basically grants, it goes back to the idea that the church subsists in the Catholic church, and therefore the church also, uh, you could say, subsists or exists outside the Catholic church. So this is why you see the Cardinal of, of Westminster in London kneeling in prayer with the archbishop, the Protestant archbishop Anglican in each other's churches. Because the cardinal, the Catholic cardinal is saying, my church is legit, your Protestant church is legit. And I affirm both of them. That is where we're getting that in Vatican II. And then the final one is Sacrosanctum Concilium. This is on the liturgy. And it says a lot of things that could be conflicting. You know, we have to retain Latin, but also vernacular. What does that mean? Does that mean 50-50, 90-10? How much Latin? How much vernacular? Clearly what we saw after the council is it goes 100% vernacular. Hey, Father, can we do the Agnus Dei in Latin during Lent be traditional? I don't know. Vatican II. I don't know if we should be doing Latin. It excludes people. It doesn't enculturate the liturgy. And that's the problem. Is that Sacrosanctum Concilium removed the prayers at the foot of the altar, prayers after the Mass, which isn't even part of the Mass technically, the last gospel, the offertory prayers that have been they were, I understand they were developed from 9th century to the 13th century, but they're beautiful and good prayers. They're part of the Roman rite. So it chopped things out. And for that, that's not good. More is more, less is less. Just ask the Eastern Orthodox. They know all about that. And they didn't change theirs. Okay, so now we get to what do we do? Where? How do we move forward with this? Three solutions. One is the classic hermeneutic of continuity. Hey, guys, this stuff can work. We can make it work. I know that this stuff in Nostra Aetate sounds crazy about Buddhists. Lumen Gentium, Muslims adoring God with us. 
the church, you know, subsists in the Catholic church, all this stuff definitely sounds new and not the way we used to think about things as Catholics, but we can massage it. We can, you know, emphasize different words and we can make the horse look like a horse. It's true. The front half of the horse and the hermeneutic of continuity doesn't look like the back half of the horse, but you got to admit it's a horse. And as long as I get you to admit that it's a horse, we've succeeded in our hermeneutic of continuity. This is the solution of John Paul II. This is the solution of Ratzinger, Bennett XVI. This is the solution of Cardinal Brandmuller. This is the solution of most conservative Catholics. Ra, 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 Vatican II. Vatican II is awesome. Yeah, but what about all the decline? Don't talk about that. That was a misapplication of the council. If we could just get back to the reality of true Vatican II Catholicism, everything would be awesome. We, this horse would be a unicorn. It would be awesome. The problem is, is you got Pope Francis citing these documents for his problematic statements. I don't know if it's a checkmate, but it's a check when Pope Francis came along. And so now we have some more radical approaches. You have the approach that uh, Bishop Schneider has put together, not put together, it's been said before. Chris is Vincent. He says, look, there is precedent in the history of the church for ecumenical councils to say things and then later be cut out by later popes. An example would be the uh, Council of Constantinople. There was a decree in there that Constantinople, the Archdiocese Patriarch of Constantinople, would be number two. The Pope saw that, even though it was finished and done at the Council, and he said, nope, I'm going to remove that canon. Bogus. Don't accept it here in Rome. There was the Quinsect Council. This was between the 5th and 6th Council. And it gave all these canons, they came to Rome, the Pope said, mm, don't know about some of these canons, don't accept it. But the most prominent one is a document called Haec Sancta. Haec Sancta was decreed at the, the Council of, oh, what was it? Got it in my notes here, just a minute. Council of Constance, April 6, 1415, Ecumenical Council. It said that the council assisted by the Holy Spirit received its power directly from God. And hence every Christian, even a Pope should obey a council. This is because at the time there were three claimants to being a Pope. They needed all three to resign and then they needed to pick a new Pope. Major, major catastrophe in church history. So the council of Constance decreed Hake Sancta. The, the next valid Pope, Martin V, recognized Hake Sancta. But then Pope Eugene, and then later on, I think it was Pope Pius II, said, nope, Hake Sancta is off the book. And definitely Vatican I is against Hake Sancta. Councils are not over popes, period. No one on earth, not even a council, judges the Pope. The Pope has the keys. So here we have a document that was in a council and then it got removed. So what Schneider's saying is, look, there are some examples in church history. We have a council and then we they go back in time and they say, mm, here's some problems, remove them. So theoretically, what could happen is either you have line item veto, portions taken out of Lumen Gentium. You just say, mm, Lumen Gentium, not so good. Nostra Aetate, not so good. A future pope removes that. Then at the most radical wing, you have Archbishop Vigano who says, let's forget the whole council. And he compares it to the Synod of Pistoia. Pistoia was an Italian council. It was not ecumenical. And that's where the analogy breaks down a little bit. But this synod was at heart Jansenist, had heretical statements. Not everything that the synod said was wrong. There were some good things in it. But there was a lot of heresy in it. You can read all about it if you have the Denzinger. All the canons of it are in there and then why they're condemned. So that council was totally condemned. 
And so uh, Vigano says, maybe that's our situation because he says Vatican II is not just the 16 documents. It's an event. It's in a, it's a event of ambiguity. The procedures were sketchy. The methods were sketchy. Originally, all the drafts were already made. In the very opening of Vatican II, they threw away all the prepared drafts that the Holy Office had made. Maybe we just get rid of all of it. And I don't know exactly what Archbishop Vigano means by that. I'd love to talk to him. I'd love to interview him. I'd love to find out that. Does it mean, because here's how I kind of understand Vatican II. Here's my opinion, and it could change. I, I'm, I'm studying this. I don't know the answer, guys. My answer is, Paul VI said, it's not under the form of extraordinary dogmatic pronouncements. It doesn't carry the mark of infallibility. So when it comes to Vatican II, my position is this. Hmm. It doesn't bear the mark of infallibility. Hmm. Interesting historical documents. Hmm. And so by that, if Vigano means, hmm, let's forget about it, I can understand that. But the more radical take on it, and I'm not sure if Vigano is saying this, maybe he is, is that a future pope explicitly states this council is in error and I remove it from the acts of the Holy See and condemn it. Now that would be a big deal. That's a big deal. So I'd love for Archbishop Vigano to clarify that and what he would see the future mechanism of how that would shake out. But those are the three. And then I guess there's a fourth view. The fourth view is Vatican II is awesome. I can't believe how awesome it is. It changed the church. We got rid of death penalty. We got rid of this whole idea that Catholics, that the Catholic church is the one true church. We got ecumenism. We're, we're hugging imams and we're hanging out at, at mosques and we love the Buddhists and we're all doing yoga. And this is just so awesome that we basically are a social justice institution and uh, that's what we're all about. And we don't have to wear habits and the nuns don't wear veils and the liturgy is just groovy. That's the fourth position. I think if you watch my channel, you don't subscribe to the fourth position. You're probably in the three views on Vatican II. You're, you're following hermeneutic continuity, JP2, B16. You're following Schneider, which I would call, which feels and looks like recognize and resist position, or the more radical vegan O position. Those are the positions. So, hey, thanks so much for watching. Appreciate all of you. If you like this video, please, pretty please, hit the like button, hit that thumbs up. And while you're next to the thumbs up, please share this video on Facebook and Twitter. And please subscribe, turn your notifications on. I really do appreciate everyone who's joined this channel and who's following it. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm trying to get the Periscope going and put some short videos up on Twitter at Periscope. But the main videos are still here always uh, at YouTube. And uh, we're going to close in prayer. We'll pray the Ave Maria like we do. And we'll pray the Gloria Patri. But before I do, as you know, at the end of every show, I say pray the rosary or you're not on the team. Praying the rosary is so key. But I've been, I've been thinking about this and I've been praying about it. And I feel challenged by our Lord to take it up a level. So I'm going to add something to this. I've been saying pray five decades every day. This comes from Our Lady of Fatima. She asks us to pray five decades every day. Pray the rosary. It takes 15 to 23 minutes, depending on how fast you pray the rosary. But I'm also going to challenge you because I realize that we are in such a theological desert. And when it comes to society, when it comes to our knowledge of who God is, we Catholics are pretty weak. And so the new challenge that I want to add moving forward is read the Bible. Read the Bible 15 minutes per day. So I'll see your rosary and I'll raise you 15 minutes of reading the Bible every day. And I'd like people to read the whole Bible, but I, I realize that can be intimidating. So we're gonna, you're going to read the four Gospels and you're going to read 15 minutes a day. Because we need to know who Jesus is. We need, see, you, you hear your priest say maybe some of these strange things, but then you say, well, you know, it's weird because 
on Tuesday, I was reading John's gospel and, and Jesus says that if you accept Abraham, then you would accept me. And if you don't accept me, you reject Abraham. So how can it be that Muslims have the faith of Abraham when Jesus said that? Because I just read that in the Bible. See, the Bible is insulation against heresy. It's the word of God. It's powerful. Or you hear someone say, well, all religions lead to God. That's what Vatican II teaches. And you're like, well, Jesus says no one comes to the Father except through me. So we have to, that's the truth. That's what Jesus taught. So we need to know who God is. Or when someone challenging the death penalty, if you've read the Bible, you know that God is okay with the death penalty. He instituted it in the book of Genesis. He gave it to Noah. It's in the Bible. But if you haven't read the book of Genesis, you don't know that. You're like, Taylor, you're crazy. God never, God would never do that. Well, that's because you got to read the Bible. So I'm going to start encouraging people to read the Bible 15 minutes every day and pray the rosary every day. Also, while we're raising the ante here, Today is the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Are you wearing the scapular? Brown scapular. Great devotion. Google it. Look it up. Wear the brown scapular. It's a devotion to the Carmelite way of life, in particular, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Beautiful devotion. Look into it. We got to start using these weapons as I, in the back of my book, Infiltration, I said, hey, if we're going to fight the war, we got to get all the weapons. The rosary is a big one. The Bible is the sword of the spirit. Did you know that? The Bible is the sword of the spirit. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. The scapular, the novenas, the ember days, the fastings, the penance, the Doctors and saints of the church, the spiritual writings, these are the things we need. We are in a battle. Praying the rosary once a month doesn't cut it. You will lose. You can't, you have to, you have to step it up. It's time to be, you know, Bishop Barron said, I'm an extremist. Okay, Bishop Barron, let's be extremists. Let's be extreme about God. Let's be extreme about being disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's be extreme about reading the Bible, memorizing the Bible. And the translation, by the way, that you need is the Dewey, the Dewey Reams. Don't know where it's, here it is. That's what you need, the DR. Get the DR. The New American Bible, no good. The New American Bible says, what does it profit for a man to lose his life? No, the Greek says, what does it profit for a man to lose his soul? That's what the Bible says. So get a good Bible. The Dewey Rhymes is a good Bible. Get the Dewey Rhymes Bible. So I'm going to close it up. Pray the rosary or you're not on the team. Also, get that Bible. Put it on your nightstand. When you get in bed at night, read 15 minutes. Or when you wake up in the morning and get that first cup of coffee, don't jump on your phone and check Twitter. Don't jump on your phone and read the latest headlines about all this craziness in the world. Jump on the Bible and read the Bible 15 minutes. Start with Matthew or Mark and, and build that momentum. Okay? That's what I that's that's kind of in prayer. I was like, you know what? It's time to ramp up. It's time to ramp up. Our enemies are ramping up. We got to ramp up. Okay, with that, we're going to close in prayer. Also keep learning those prayers. Learn your prayers, the Memorare, the St. Michael prayer, the Angel of God prayer, Ave Maria, Gloria Patri. Learn your prayers. Have them in your mind. All right, we're going to close in prayer. We're going to pray the Ave Maria and the Gloria Patri. We're going to pray that we have a church centered on the truth, truth and love. Oremos. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pronobis peccatoribus, nunc et et or mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Everlasting, merciful Father, we ask you would bless all of us, and that you would inspire us to live heroic lives for Jesus Christ, that you would give us faith, 
hope, and charity, and that you would inspire us to know our faith and to know you. And we ask that you would help us to love the prayers you've given us in the Holy Church, to love the rosary, to love the Bible, the sacred scriptures, and to love one another. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. That's a show, folks. Thanks for watching. Appreciate all of you. Please, if you haven't already, hit that like button, thumb it up. Please share it on Facebook if you haven't done that already. I know a lot of you already have. And also thanks to everybody on Patreon who's supporting. I signed over, over 100 books yesterday. And um, they, those all went out yesterday. Joy mailed them all out. So you'll be getting signed books soon. If you want to support me and my channel, go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. Till next time, remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Bring souls to Jesus. Amen. God bless. Godspeed.